Thank you very much, and uh, thanks, Clyde. Um, the, the kind of knockout um, statistic, I suppose, in a sense, uh, is, is the, the words uh, at the end about the impact on the economy of the interventions that, that Clyde has, has set out. And I think when I began, uh, when I looked at the start of the, of the presentation, the issue for me was the, the lines on the, the graph, the curves, particularly the ones around emotional control and habitual ways of responding and the fact that they were set at such an early age. And I don't think really that's something that we're not aware of. And I also don't think from much of the work that's gone on within Scotland recently, and most of you, well, many of you may have heard Harry Burns talk about uh, the impact of early years, um, the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland, talk about the influence of early years on health subsequently in the, on the whole life course. So there is a, a, an extent to which some of this we know, and in fact quite a lot of this we know. The interesting thing for me was the application of the tool and the consequences for the information that we then have. And I think part of me, again, when I heard the early part of the discussion, was thinking, well, you're waiting until the child is five to ask them these questions, by which time the um, influences have had their effect. And, of course, the answer to that, I suppose, Clyde would say is, well, you've got to start somewhere. So you have to apply the tool and then you have to go back and start the interventions. And of course, so far as we're concerned in terms of public policy, the statement, well, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the interventions, uh, an interventions-based approach may not work. You have to work with the whole community. Is again, I think, something intuitively we know about, but what we do in terms of government is interventions. Actually, we produce policies, we see through interventions, um, and that is the kind of approach, certainly, that we have been taking with, for instance, um, the Family Nurse Partnership. We, we are looking at the Family Nurse Partnership. We are interested in evidence-based interventions. Uh, we also know that those evidence-based interventions will, um, there is evidence that they work, of course they do, but it's about how we mobilize communities and it seems to me that this tool gives us a means of examining communities in a way that possibly we don't at the moment. And then we can tailor interventions, we can, we can look at layering interventions, and as you say, um, the way in which then the community responds. And I think the, the interest for us is the, in building up the community, as it were, and the capacity of the community and the agencies around that are, are of interest, of course. But again, um, as we move into, uh, in the UK, as, as in many other parts of the world, into straightened economic circumstances, and into areas where there is pressure on, on the public purse, and there is uh, a pressure on, on things that might not have an immediate impact. So in other words, obviously what is being looked at is, well, can we get rid of this particular thing because we can't see an immediate impact? And in those circumstances, then, it is a very useful thing to be able to say, well, look, if you do this, you will have, there will be an economic impact down the, the road, which will be profound. And so, from, from our point of view, I mean, this is useful. It brings together much of, of what we know, frankly, but it gives us a means of, of looking at that. And so it's a very interesting uh, development, I think, uh, and also uh, one which, if we were looking for indicators of of as it were, community efficacy that then had an effect on the individuals within that community is a, is a very interesting uh, tool to look at, I think. Uh, because obviously one of the other things that we are interested in, and, and maybe on the health side of, of the equation, we have heat targets which look at what we think of as the performance of the National Health Service. Um, and some of those things are around kind of the, the percentage of, of women breastfeeding and that kind of thing. But most of them are very much around waiting times, etc. So uh, this kind of broader indicator and the feedback from the, the, that broader indicator into um, interventions and what you might call community empowerment is a, is a very interesting and fascinating um, interface, I think. So it's something in which uh, I'm certainly very interested. Uh, and if we could have a means of, of um, 
fitting interventions within a framework and if those interventions um, we can show that there is a, a, an economic benefit you know, we can point to evidence of economic benefit in these circumstances in the current climate that's obviously going to be a very useful thing and so I've found it a, a very useful uh, discussion uh, I'm sure there'll be, there's more to come but uh, from my point of view fascinating uh, and, and some very useful insights so thank, you. thank you John Val Thank you very much. Um, I kind of have a horrible feeling this might be subject to the law of diminishing returns. I'm glad I'm at this end of the table. Um, yeah, a, a absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, really kind of emphasising, as, as, as John suggested, a lot of the things that we thought we knew, and it's really very encouraging to discover that we are probably right to think that we know some of this stuff. Um, this is the first time that, that I've, I've been made aware of the EDI and of that whole population approach as, as it's playing out in Canada, and I did find that absolutely fascinating. And I, I did go onto the website, and I looked at the EDI, and I looked in particular at the teacher's notes for it, which I found fascinating because it is actually incredibly intuitive and straightforward. And I can, I can really see that you could probably deliver that in relation to a single child in 10 to 15 minutes. And, you know, that, that, that was fascinating. I know that's not exactly what you wanted me to talk about, but I, but I thought that was really very interesting. Um, I, I think for many of us, the, the economic case for investing in early years is, is totally convincing. It's compelling. We know the stuff that, that Dave Vicarts and you know, the Perry Preschool has, has generated. We're familiar with, with the work of Heckman. I was fascinated by your final slide and that notion of um, one percentage point gain in GDP for every 1% reduction in EDI vulnerability. Um, I, I think, certainly in a Scottish context where we have a First Minister who comes from an economist background, I think that's a very powerful lever. I guess the downside of this is all, always the same thing, it's jam tomorrow, or you know, jam in 5, 10, 15 years time, which kind of takes me back to a conversation I was having with Sally just before the, the presentation started about the experience of the Getting It Right for Every Child Pathfinder in Highland region. It's not really a region any longer, is it? Um, which seems to me, Clyde, to really push pretty much all of the buttons that you were talking about in relation to those interventions or those indicators that seem to make a difference uh, in those those neighborhoods, those residential areas, which were consistently performing better than you might have expected. So what Getting It Right for Every Child does is it aims to bring together all of the local services and agencies um, to focus on the needs of an individual child and indeed children in their area. It looks to rationalize a whole set of processes and procedures and actually ideally secure some, some resource efficiencies as a result of that and what we are finding is that that does indeed happen and crucially you would think it looks to deliver out uh, better outcomes and again the evidence from the Highland Pathfinder is that both of those things are happening and for me the great strength of that is it's, it's a kind of jam today um, or certainly jam tomorrow because if we can go to local service providers, delivery partners and say if, if you do this stuff in this way and if you do it well, you can actually free up resources, which clearly, as, as John's been saying, is absolutely critical at a time when nationally, globally, those resources are going to come under increasing pressure, and that's not a short-term problem. That's going to be for five, ten years. So I think kind of setting that alongside the messages about the long-term gains, we begin to have what for me is a pretty compelling story and I think, at the risk of sounding a bit Pollyanna-ish and kind of, you know, we sorted it because clearly we haven't, I think we do have some models and, and ways of doing the business in Scotland which, if we can extend across that whole population, will actually begin to deliver the kinds of changes 
the improvements in outcome for individual kids, for communities, and for the nation as a whole over time. So, you know, hugely encouraged by it. I, I think it's really fascinating, and I think probably the time is right. Uh, again, John referred to the work that Harry Burns, Chief Medical Officer, has been doing around the importance of early childhood. So many people in Scotland now, so many of the key kind of movers and shapers have now been exposed to, to that information, to that presentation, that I think there is a real groundswell beginning. And I guess the final point I'd like to make is around those, those of us who, or those of you who are kind of directly involved in delivering services, the, the message that came through from, for me overwhelmingly about the presentation was the importance of high quality, smart, you said, family policies. And I guess the big risk for us in Scotland is that many of our delivery partners are sailing into kind of straightened times, straightened circumstances. Uh, local authorities in particular will need to think long and hard about how they deploy their resources. There is always a tendency to go for the stuff that you have to do, the statutory services, maintain those. And a lot of the family support services, the parenting agenda, all the rest of it, which seems to me absolutely central to what you're describing here, Clyde, that they're not statutory. And I think in the past they've been seen as a bit of an optional add-on. And I really worry that, that, that the biggest risk facing us is the loss of those services where they have been developed and are showing to be very effective. Thanks, Val. Very insightful. Rachel. Thank you, uh, also from me. Um, I really enjoyed this. I think it, I'm a public health doctor, and so for me, this is just such a, uh, an encouraging example of how population level data can, it is so crucial for supporting a wide range of activity from local planning right up to high level global advocacy. I really like the notion of taking a population health monitoring approach as well as a sort of response to what sometimes seem like sort of paralyzing levels of complexity in systems and um, what I would argue is too much focus on trying to uh, trial very specific interventions and agonize over how you uh, construct robust evaluations of complex interventions and um, having this population-wide approach I think is a really helpful uh, response to some of that. I also think it's a a really good way of, of helping the promotion of thinking of early childhood as a time of universal uh, intervention requirement and a sort of a, a population-wide uh, suite of services for people of all levels of needs. I think there's too much focus at the moment on uh, trying to identify people with particular need and somehow magically target them uh, with particular interventions. And, and in the process of, of doing this, kind of losing sight of population-wide approaches. So I, I find that really helpful. Um, the other things that I would say, I think, we've all said that we kind of, yes, we're already sold on this idea of how important early childhood is, and but yet we don't measure child development <coughs> in this. I think that's probably, it's important to say that. Absolutely. Um, we do very well. We do measure quite a lot of things very well uh, in Scotland, but uh, child development is is a rather glaring omission at the moment. And so I think it's very interesting uh, to talk about the EDI in Scotland um, at the moment. The, I mean, I have some practical questions about how the EDI works, I think. I, I think it is interesting that you very much try to explicitly dissociate um, population health monitoring from, in, from uh, assessing. Looking, assessing individual children and providing their own teachers with information on which to plan their mm. learning. I can see why um, that has its attractions, but it is contrary, for example, to how we're trying to move in terms of collecting our national health data sets. We're trying to have national data, population health data, falling out of processes of direct patient uh, care rather than as parallel um, special data collection exercises. And I think the arguments for and against that are quite interesting. It um, 
they introduce different motivations, different potential biases and such like into the data. And then finally, I, I mean, I think there are issues around practicability that are interesting. Although you're saying it's quite straightforward to administer, it still has resource implications. Mm -hmm. There are quite a lot of variables on the EDI. Is, does it, are there, um, is it in your future plans to look and see how, how much can you scale back and still be valid? Yes. You know, how, particularly if you're talking globally in resource constrained settings, um, what's the age window that you can actually administer this at? Does it have to be in the education um, sector? Can, uh, are there options to deliver this through other sectors such as the health sector? Um, so those are some practical questions I would have. Well, we may give quite a chance to comment on some of those things in a few minutes. So we'll go to our last panelist now, Rosemary. So thanks, Clyde. I'll try and be brief because an uh, inspiring talk. Um, I just have about three comments to make. I think the first one is <clears throat> I think most people working in anything to do with child development would be aware that it's, it is quite a difficult area because it cuts across so many sectors. Um, and I think traditionally we have tried often to measure child health or child education or whatever. So I think what's really inspiring about this is that it's a tool which which really cuts across sectors. It's got everything there. And it's interesting that the policy spoken about earlier um, about Bell, um, getting it right for every child, which is the um, Scottish sort of child health policy, Cuts, tries to cut across sectors as well and get out of that silo mentality. So I think, in a way, the, the EDI or a similar tool which measures um, child development across all those sectors is something that could really complement um, the policy that we have, um, which, which tries to do that. So that's the first point. The second point... Um, it's just following up on Rachel's, um, what, what she mentioned about it not being an individual level tool, and you made that very clear. And um, I, my feeling is in an ideal world, we should have, definitely have individual level tools, which, you know, clinicians, teachers, whatever, those have to be there that we can screen for behavior, we can follow up on individual ch children, but I think equally um, we, we have to have population level tools like this. And so I, I don't think we should see any kind of tension between um, individual level tools or measurements um, which, say, clinicians or educationists want to use and a population level tool. I think that there's, there's a place for both of those. Um, the third point is what made me quite <coughs> excited was just at the end when you were saying looking, you, um, you looked at communities and you, 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 you showed this, the, the graph with all the dots on it and um, areas that had regularly exceeded expectations and I think that's something kind of hadn't thought of before. When we think of interventions we're always thinking of some of all singing, dancing, intervention, you bring in, you almost sort of transplant from somewhere else because it works there and you try and put it in here. And I think what I really liked about that idea was to say, you know, in your own country or in this area, what's working really well to make these people exceed expectations and, and examine that and then transplant that just to somewhere else in your own country. And I think that's that's a nice idea. I think the last point is just to really what struck me is when you said um, we we should do for child development what we do for child survival, and I think that that really is so true. We go to great efforts for child survival, and then once babies have survived, that's them. Um, and we we really should do more for child development and be able to measure that as well. Thank you, Professor
Okay, we have 10 or 15 minutes for responses. I'm going to step down a bit. I'll just keep an eye on things from the coordination point. I'm going to get Clyde to come up here because your questions may be questions that you want to direct at Clyde. Clyde, you want to take the podium? Um, and uh, if it's a question more about Scotland, I, I think one of the panelists would be more likely to take it, but I think I'll let them sort that out. So, Clyde, I'm going to just help you field questions here. So, okay. uh, questions or comments? We have Andrew Tannehill, Public Health Physician. Go ahead, Andrew. Andrew Tannehill, Public Health Physician. Thank you very much. Can I thank you very much for an excellent presentation? Uh, in addition to um, expressing pleasure at seeing such a, a well developed information system, I'd like, if I may, to uh, elaborate on a point that Rosemary uh, was making. I'm a public health specialist who works in the evidence field, and I've been very interested in trying to find ways of going beyond basing action on evaluations of particular interventions in isolation. And I think that for me, a really important part of your presentation is uh, that it provides important pointers to do just that. This whole notion of using an information system to identify what have become known in some places as positive deviance, and then identify within these communities assets, and learn from these assets and try to apply that learning in neighbourhoods. And I think, I would argue, take the opportunity when you do that of identifying the existing assets in these neighbourhoods. seems to me to have so much more promise than depending exclusively on learning from dropping in individual interventions to neighbourhoods uh, without any thought that they might have assets. Uh, putting an emphasis on deficits or perceived deficits with the risks that the effects will not be gained because they will, the, the, the neighbourhoods concerned it and the people in them are overwhelmed by other uh, influences and with the risk of perpetuating or worsening hidden inequalities within the neighbourhoods. It's a long comment. Have I got <laughs> the right end of the list? Yeah, no, I think you absolutely have. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. I, just to add one idea to it. One of the things that we've noticed in BC when you do compare the positive and negative outliers and the positive trend people uh, areas and so forth is that in the negative areas, some of the time what you have is, is communities that are so divided that if one community, part of the community buys into an idea or an intervention, the other part of the community will run as far as it can or try to, uh, to undermine it, right? And that might be partly why you sometimes get, in fact, you do something that on its surface you can't imagine it could do more harm than good, but somehow in aggregate it does, right? And that does seem to be what happens. When you go at early childhood, you're opening up the social rule book of an existing community, and if you don't if you don't work with the social rule book, you're in trouble. And so I remember when I first saw the first results of the uh, strong start, is it sure start, sure start uh, uh, here, where they said, well, look, in some of these uh, poor communities, things seem to be getting worse. And I kept thinking, well, has anybody gone in and done the ethnography of it? You know, you don't want to just stop and go, it didn't work. Let's try something else. You want to go in and understand what the dynamics are. And it was the same in Canada when they tried community-based intervention. So I really like what you had to say there. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was very interested in the point that uh, Rachel made about population versus individual assessment. And I think the United Kingdom will tend to focus on the individual and the outcomes for that individual. And we target children and say we can make you better, mm -hmm. either medically or, or in any other way. Um, what about the acceptability to the Canadian population for being tested? with no actual perceivable individual benefit because we had an analogy to this in the UK where the English health department recommended measurement of children, their growth uh, strategy, right. and the children were measured in schools and the results were communicated by their teachers. In the evaluation, and Rachel will probably remember we looked at this, in the evaluation parents were very non-accepting of the idea that you should be measured without benefit to you as an individual family or child. So good point. Okay, so, yeah, this is a really good one. Um, first, you have to understand, I'm a university professor, right? And we do the EDIs in the school under passive consent. 
right? Passive consent, meaning that notes go home to the parents, but kids are only pulled out if the parents actively pull them out. Otherwise, all the kids are in. And that's the basis of population-based data. You absolutely know that the 30% of parents who would never send back an active consent form are going to be from families that systematically differ from the others, right? So starting with that, then the question is, if we want to do something by passive consent, could we possibly get away with a tool that was conceived as, a, as an intervention tool coming in from the outside on the basis of passive consent? Answer, no, right? So part of the reason, and you can see, I was talking out of both sides of my mouth at the same time with this, because we know having done true prospective follow-up, that the EDI outperforms any individual clinical or educational psychology tool in predicting how kids will do three or four years later in school. The only way you can do better is do a battery of about five hours of stuff, and you can get maybe about 5% better prediction. So we know it's good, right? But we have that problem that as long as we're doing it this way, as long as it's not just simply embedded right into the school system, uh, as a, an administrative fiat, then, then we can't go on. Now, why shouldn't they do it? Well, they probably should, but what's happened in Canada is where the EDI has been run by the government as opposed to by the universities, people don't produce pretty maps the way we do. They start suppressing the data because there's, you know, turns out like some of the northern communities in particular where, you know, 60, 70 percent of the kids are vulnerable, you know, the government people don't want to publish that, so they hide the data, right? So this arm's length thing is, is crucial, it turns out, to actually producing the data. So we get caught in that set of institutional circumstances. Now, having said that, the fact is the kindergarten teachers who fill the data, nobody's stopping them from making notes in their day books for Xeroxing the things. Now, we're now at doing it on computers, so it isn't like that anymore. But there's nothing stopping them from doing that. And in fact, quietly, there is a cottage industry of using the data that way. Moreover, we actually have another part, a way of we analyze the data, where we break it down into 16 subscales. And we look at kids who are vulnerable on 9 out of 16 of the subscales. And the subscales are very sort of uh, coherent from the standpoint of developmental psychology. Turns out that across the province, by school district, there's about an 8 to 1 difference on the proportion of kids who come up on the multiple challenge index, which is 9 or out of 16 or more. However, when you look at the proportion of kids who get designated as special needs, in other words, they attract more money for the school district. There's virtually no variation across the province, right? It's all based on school systems knowing how many kids they can designate before the province will start pushing back and saying, we don't want to give you $22,000 per kid anymore, right? So it is interesting that this data that's being collected for other non-administrative purposes is actually showing something that's way more honest than the stuff that is done for those purposes. So, so we've got another collision coming, right? So we are lucky, actually, that nobody said, damn it, you know, the, the data has to benefit those individual children in order to uh, be useful. Because, you know, as you pointed out, I mean, our primary look is the backward look. This is end of pipe technology, right? So we're primarily saying this is a portrait of the quality of the nurturant experiences in this community over the last five years, right? And secondarily, it's about the challenges of the school. Yeah. Other thoughts, comments? Yes, Phil, Phil Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much, Chef. I was from the University of Glasgow and the UK as well. Mm -hmm. um, a, a group of us, largely inspired by your work, uh, have been trying to uh, push for the collection of population based data on early childhood in Glasgow. And we have succeeded in a small way, partly by uh, engaging the professionals. Uh, at a level where the data they collect have use in their professional work with the individual child, as well as uh, use in needs assessment and in evaluation of interventions, and possibly in local management uh, resources as well. Um, it's been quite a difficult task. We've, we've succeeded in getting um, the strength and difficulties questionnaire data collected at school entry, which is perhaps not as good as the EDI, but it's, it goes some way to the social and social development. Um, but it's a fragile uh, flower that we're growing, and I'm interested in knowing how you have succeeded in collecting data robustly for all schools in your areas over time. It's a, it's a value of what you 
Yeah. Uh, and it's all inclusive nature, and it would be so good to be able to achieve something like that in Glasgow and in Scotland. Yeah. Uh, ideally, at school entry, and ideally, in my view, also much earlier as well in terms of things like language development, child behaviour. It would be great to be able to the first month. Yeah. Okay, the question of how do we manage to pull this off, given that it's so hard to do these sort of things in Britain. It's a very good question, and to start off with, one of the advantages that we have is locally elected school boards. So you don't have to convince a Ministry of Education or something like that to do it. That if you can get the superintendent for the geographic area to get interested, and he will let you then meet with the principals and vice principals and all the rest of it, you can build it up from enthusiastic community to enthusiastic community. In fact, what happened in British Columbia is we started with the Vancouver School District, which just had leadership that wanted to be the first to do anything new, right? So it was based on that. We convinced them, we went out and we did a lot of work with the teachers unions and all the rest of it and convincing people that this was fundamentally different from what the right-wing think tanks were doing to undermine public education. And so we, we rode that wave. Now, of course, remember in Canada, I mean, it's, it's not as much as it used to be, but we're still in a situation where fundamentally the, what you would call the state schools is the means of delivery of education. You don't have a long tradition of private schools and all the rest of it, and unfortunately that's changing. But what it means then is that, is that the degree to which you get like the implicit pushback, which is that if you pry open those questions, you're prying open the class system and you're prying, prying open, you know, the what you would call public schools versus state schools sort of thing. That isn't such a big deal, right? So that made it easier to get under the, the radar. And then what happened is, we hit on the idea of the mapping for serendipitous reasons and the idea that color coding would allow people to understand because the proportion of people who are in Newmarket is high. And the maps of our first wave of data got into the Vancouver, the main Vancouver newspaper on a slow, slow news day right after Christmas in 2001. And when it happened, all of a sudden, all these other school districts started lining up behind it, right? And one of the things that we discovered right off the bat was that people who have responsibilities for children do not care about randomly sampled children. We have a national longitudinal study of children and youth made up of 30,000, 40,000 kids across the country. And you can see the patterns that we're talking about in those data. But they're randomly sampled kids. They're not my kids. But once we produced the maps that said, this is exactly what's happening with the kids in your area, right? We're not inferring it from socioeconomic status. We're not inferring it from kids matched on some grouping factor from 2,000 kilometers away. These are your kids. All of a sudden, all sorts of people who would deflect everything else get get involved, right? And that was the key dynamic, right? A, getting around in numeracy by colors, and B, this is your kids. And then once that started to happen, it built up by volunteer communities. In fact, we had done 35 of the 59 geographic school districts in BC before the Ministry of Education phoned me to first ask what we were doing. So that was three years in before I received my first phone call from there, right? So it was a very interesting dynamic, and I understand the difficulties here. To be honest with you, after we finished the, uh, you know, the, the uh, WHO commission report, Michael Marmot ran a, a thing for like adapting it to Britain, and I was invited into that, and we wrote some stuff, and we talked about an information system just like this, and it just got like, it just got, I, I, there's a one or two words left in the document, but mostly it got pushed out, partly by people being insulted that you could learn anything from Canada, partly by... <laughs> <laughs> stigmatization, partly by postmodernism, you know, and all of that. So, you know, like all of the different things that you could imagine all sort of came at it, right? Yeah. All right, we'll take another one. Linda? Here, just second. to follow on that question of schools yeah. and Val and John's support for this measure, and maybe knowing and having learned from what you've done, we don't need to go through all that process. Could Val or John comment with you? Never see the Scottish government saying this is something the education department, NHS boards need to collectively collect universally. You or me? Well, I can't say. Yeah, I think we can uh, probably both comment. But uh, I think that this is a very early, early look 
you know, and I, I think to, to make any kind of commitment at this stage clearly is not uh, within our gift. Uh, however, uh, there is interest uh, in uh, collecting information and understanding the, the, the vulnerabilities, I suppose, is, is one means of, of um, setting that out. But of course there are other means of collecting information, although they are not necessarily what you might call vul vulnerability. But we have lots of information collection systems, um, and you know the, uh, a lot of the discussion that has happened today, as, as I said at the start, I think we know this stuff, and it's it's about our ability to then make a difference uh, based on the information we have and the fact that we know uh, a lot about the influences of early life. Well. Master me. Um, it, it, it does seem to me that there's a whole industry um, that, that has kind of taken off in the last year or so um, in which Scottish Government is hugely active, um, looking to develop, to identify and develop um, a whole range of national indicators and outcome measures. Um, associated with all kinds of um, policy areas linked directly to national outcomes. And that's certainly a piece of work that is being taken forward apace in the context of the early years agenda. Um, you'll know as, as well as anyone, Linda, that the level of commitment that the Scottish Government and individual ministers, and Mr Ingram in particular, has and have to the NES framework and that whole agenda, recognising it as a kind of slow burn agenda that, that will take a decade or more to deliver anything. So I, I think there's real commitment to the, the objectives and the intentions behind that. The fundamental question you ask, would government buy something like this? Well, not for me to answer. I think it's very, very interesting, but, but Clyde spoke very I think powerfully about some of the reasons why you struggled in Canada, um, and it does strike me that, that you know governments the world over face similar difficulties. Um, having said that, I certainly think it's something that I would want to be at least discussing with with my minister and kind of talking in general terms about what we've heard t tonight and about the discussion across the floor. Because again, I think that speaks to the huge level of interest and, and commitment that there is across the country to, to actually pressing forward this agenda. We, I have saw another question here, and then we probably did one there, and then we should probably wrap it up. Go ahead. It, it's, it's just going back to whether you talk about communities generally, how parents have been engaged, or have they been, and what they're doing. You know, because parents are part of communities. I, I don't think we're very good in this society at looking at people and places and relationships. Yes. Yes. Um, and most parents, we have to believe, want the best for their children. And at a community level, that we know that's what makes a difference. But it's back to the complexity of working in the early years, and the complexity can be bewildering, but actually, you know, you're not going to do it until the age of the children. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I mean, we've been doing better and better with parents lately, partly because today's parents are on the internet, right? So we've been posting lectures on YouTube and doing this kind of thing is one way to do it. The other thing is, is that some of the studies that we've been doing at the local community level are partly about whether or not you actually get the kind of regional differences in parenting style that could help explain some of the differences. Right? And, you know, it's interesting, there's, there's short and long ways to do that. On our National Longitudinal Study of Children and Youth, there's this cute little 11 quiet question index that they use that ends up giving you four different kinds of parents. The authoritative, who are meant to be the good guys, the sort of good enough parents, right, who are kind of 
have rules but enforce them flexibly, et cetera, et cetera. And then the authoritarian, the inconsistent, and the disengaged, right? And you can see large differences between how that first group of kids do versus the other three, even after you take into account SES. But we've also been working with like parent organizations insofar as we can find them to try to, you know, bring in a parent voice more proactively. And it's been interesting too with the letters that we send home. I mean, every year that we do the EDI, we have to send 40 or 50,000 of these letters home. And you know, you do get some interesting, you do get some interesting responses. Not very many, but you get some interesting responses. So, so we're working away at it. We're working away at it. And up here, go ahead. Um, I'm a former director of public health. Great. In, in a way, I'm, I'm here listening as a, as a granny. <laughs> um, it's absolutely fantastic, your, your story. And it's also for me, as somebody with a long um, memory backwards, fantastic what is already happening in Scotland, the interventions you talked about. The, the reason I prefer to be a granny is that my preschool grandchildren and my primary school grandchildren are having assessments like this at the moment. Now, it may not all be being collated, which is the yes. problem, but if, and this is really key to those that you work with, when you go to talk with the minister, you're not necessarily talking about a whole lot of human resources. It's about talking about collating the resources that are already being used. Because mm -hmm. a lot of this is already being done for the benefit of the individual child, but this is about putting it together in, in public health or public education. It's, yeah, no, I think that that's a very important point. I mean, quite often you can take existing data flows and you can organize them into into population-based data. You know, why doesn't it happen? You know, it's 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 fascinating. I mean, if I were to tell you all of the you know roadblocks we've had to fight through in relation to this, it's just remarkable. Right? <laughs> and virtually all of the things that people raise, in effect, dissolve on contact. You know, you have privacy concerns. Well, people, in a sense, don't make a distinction in their mind between data that is being collected by people who have no personal incentive to snoop into you and have got all these computer systems set up to anonymize data on the one hand versus that whole vast credit card world out there, you know, which will find out if you don't pay for a parking ticket, you know, six months later, you know, you can't, you can't buy a house or something like that because they've all got their data together. And it's interesting, at least in Canada, there's an elaborate bureaucracies now to deal with all of the public stuff, but there's nothing in relation to the private. And, you know, you get caught up in that really, really a lot. Um, but, you know, I, I would just like to second that. You know, I mean, it, the, the distance that we could go by finding ways to take things that are routinely done right now and codifying them and moving them into this kind of world is, is huge. And, in fact, one of the things we're working on now is, is uh, in the province of Ontario where they have a, pretty much a population-based 18-month platform for, for immunization, that they're expanding it out now to make it a developmental assessment and we're making sure that a subset of the developmental assessment will be computerized and will go into a population-based data stream. So to try to get these things to do double duty, I mean, we should be doing that, clearly. Yeah. The last thing I'll just say in answer to one of your things was, yes, there are shorter forms. There is a 48-question version of the EDI and there's also on the... UNICEF International Household Survey, the mixed survey, there is about 10 items embedded on there that started life as being the three best items from our five scales. So it started life as 15 items that carried most of the variants, sort of winnowed down to the 10 that they had time. So there are those things. Yeah, yeah. very good. Well, I want to thank uh, the panel uh, very much. Uh, and I also want to thank Clyde. And, you know, I, I don't know exactly how to thank him. We're going to take him for dinner and uh, we want you to all join us downstairs now for a um, for a, a wine reception, <coughs> wine and nibbles. But I do I do want to say that um, you know he, he he doesn't seem like a Scot to you, but you know his first name is the same as the greatest river of Scotland. So there has to be a connection, and I want to thank him for what he's done for us tonight. Thank you. Yeah.